I'm Doug Keck, and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark through the magic of television. We're joined by Aurora Griffin, author of How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard, 40 Tips for Faithful College Students, published by our friends at Ignatius Press, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. And she is coming to us live from our EWTN studios in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Aurora Griffin. Thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. That's great. Some of our audience who watches EW10 on a regular basis may recognize you for being on with uh, our friars on our Life on the Rock program. And, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so it's great that you could find a chance to be with us as an author. Let me ask you a question. With this particular book, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard, 40 Tips for Faithful College Students is the title. Now, is this the first book you, you've actually written? That's correct. And you know, I was never planning on writing it in the first place. Uh, so who knows when the second one will come. This is just something that I really felt God wanted me to do to mm -hmm. make it easier for the next generation of Catholic students to keep their faith in college. Right. Now, the, the book itself and, and the acknowledgments I thought was interesting because you really talk about the importance of family in your life and ongoing and how mm -hmm. important that is. And you, you thank at the very beginning that your dad for teaching me the catechism a chi as a child and reading through Bible stories with mm -hmm. me because you never watered down the truth. I'm not afraid of it when it seems difficult mm -hmm. or inconvenient. Why was that important to you? That's right. <laughs> You know, I, th I think that a, a lot of times um, when we talk to the faith, uh, talk about the faith to young Catholics, we try to tell them it's cool, it boils down to being nice, it doesn't mm -hmm. really challenge you to, um, to do anything different than you're already doing. Um, but I learned from a young age from my dad mm -hmm. that sometimes the, the faith calls you to do things mm -hmm. that you're uncomfortable with, things that are beyond where you're currently at, right. and you don't change it to accommodate you you grow um, to, to rise to that standard. Mm -hmm. And that's a lesson that stayed with me all my life. Now, is that an example of maybe what uh, you use to stand up when you, the whole satanic mass thing was happening, which you talk about in the book itself? Absolutely. Um, so th that's a, a bit of a story here. But I do, I, I think that the, the important principle that it came back for, for me, I, I remember when my dad told me, we were very young, and he said, look, at some point, you're going to have to decide between something you really want um, and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to ask, is this thing that I want more important than my faith? Mm -hmm. And in this case, the group of Satanists was trying to have their black mass um, the, the final week of finals, my senior year. Mm -hmm. So I was busy studying for exams, and I had to choose, is my academic career more important than my faith? Mm -hmm. Um, I've always said that my faith is more important, but if I don't fight the black mass, mm -hmm. uh, what does that really say about who I am and what my priorities are? Right. Um, so I remembered my dad's words and, um, you know, with the, with the whole Catholic community there uh, sprung into action to mm -hmm. prevent it. Mm -hmm. You also acknowledge uh, your mother's contribution, showing me what faith in charity looks like by constantly giving mm -hmm. of yourself to me and Paul. Is Paul your brother? Mm -hmm. Paul is my brother, yes. Okay. So do you think there, th that that was an example of that kind of complementarity that exists between a man and a woman and a, and a parents in, in, in a situation, mm -hmm. that balance that helped you? Absolutely. It's, it's so beautiful to see it. Um, it, 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 really, it seems, at least, um, you know, the way my parents have modeled it, it's, uh, it's not 50-50, mm -hmm. it's 100-100. Mm -hmm. uh, each have given fully of themselves in really different ways. My dad in more of a leadership and kind of instructional way, and my mom in um, a, a supportive way. Right. Uh, and we needed both, and it, that was really beautiful. All right. Now, Peter Kraft uh, is well known to all of our, our viewers here on EW10, certainly on Bookmark as well, mm -hmm. for his wonderful uh, books. He, he did the forward, and he said, some books give you brilliant philosophy or scholarship. This one gives you something more precious and uncommon, common sense. And he goes on to talk about it being utterly mm -hmm. practical. Now, your experience in academia as a young person, why is that true? Why does it seem to be that common sense is in such short supply today? Hmm. 
You know, I'll borrow another Peter Kraft quote to answer that question. Um, he says that it takes a PhD uh, to convince yourself that some things aren't true, mm -hmm. um, or to convince yourself that certain foolish ideas are true. I think that um, sometimes education can let us hide from ourselves mm -hmm. um, and let us deny things that are uh, commonsensically true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so when, when you are in these places like Harvard or Oxford or any of these other places I've been blessed to be, it's so important to, uh, to stay in the faith and to mm -hmm. hold on to the things that you know to be true, even if you could talk your way around them. Right. He, he goes on to say, and no place is more important than the university because the university has replaced the church, the state, and even the family as the primary teacher and cultural determinant. So do you agree with that, and why do you think that has happened? Hmm. Oh, th this could be a this could be a history lesson that that goes back, you know, and, and traces uh, the uh, what's been happening in education and the media and politics the last two hundred years in the West. Um, I I do think that w we see a lot of the things that John Paul II uh, talked about in his encyclicals, and and Francis has talked about, and Benedict talked about, where um, the family mm -hmm. structure is weakening and. Uh, the state is stepping in, filling some of those roles, um, and as it does, sometimes makes it harder for, for families to stand on their own two feet. But that's a, that's a much broader discussion. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, the, the church is right in saying that we should be doing everything we can to, to support good families. Mm -hmm. Now, in the preface, you talk about mm -hmm. your graduation day, May 29, 2014, and you go to, that you were mm -hmm. surprised that the major component of that was people congratulating you that you were able to stay Catholic at Harvard. Now, why mm -hmm. is it so difficult at a secular university for someone to stay Catholic? Mm -hmm. And you even point out it's not even just good enough to stay Catholic. You have to keep progressing as a Catholic, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. If you're not growing, uh, you're shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I th so I think that it can be hard for students for a couple different reasons. Um, some students get on campus and it's the first time they're away from their parents and they, they want to exercise their freedom and be able to go to parties and do what they want. Um, some students get in their first philosophy class and they've had great faith formation like mm -hmm. I had, but never really had someone challenge their faith, and that's uh, really unsettling mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. For me, I, th I found the most difficult part about staying Catholic at Harvard um, the commitment of time. Mm -hmm. Th there were so many good things going on on campus, so many interesting people passing through with great ideas, and you always had to make a decision between goods. Um, and to keep in mind that uh, that your faith is the highest good and to continue mm -hmm. uh, going to mass every day even when you could go to you know so and so's famous lecture um, and then to have so to have the faith stay first in your priorities in your time mm -hmm. but then also in your heart you know you th there are a lot of great right. things that you can get really attached to that are, that are not the faith um, so right. That, that's, uh, that, I think, was the hardest thing for me. And you say, uh, for a Catholic going to a secular university, it's all too easy to get swept up in what the world says is important in college, like you were saying. But you say, I found that faith doesn't yeah. take away from the yeah. rest of life. Is that the impression a lot of people, your peers, have, that it does take away from life? I don't think the ones who actually live it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think that's a fear that people have, and then it turns out not to be true. So they're worried people are going to think I'm ridiculous or mm -hmm. I'm not going to get the job I want. I'm not going to be able to uh, get A's in my classes. You know, whatever your goals are, I think uh, the enemy wants to whisper in our ear that um, you're not going to be able to have both this and your faith. And for me, that just simply mm -hmm. wasn't the case. And that's part of the reason I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. I experienced all of the most important things uh, about college life through my faith and never in spite of it. Right. You say here, living out my faith in college was not something I did in addition to my schoolwork, extracurriculars, mm -hmm. and social life, but was something that shaped how I experienced all those things. Explain what you mean. Yes. 
Um, so I, I was very influenced um, by a group called Opus Dei, mm -hmm. um, who were uh, who who have groups who that are close to most major universities, mm -hmm. and um, they they have a, a beautiful spirituality of living out your faith through work. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you if you follow this um, Jose Maria Escriva's way of um, talking about sanctifying your work, then all of a sudden your your prayer, um, sorry, your your homework is uh, mm -hmm. is prayer. You set an intention. You say, "I'm gonna I'm gonna do this for the sake of mm -hmm. someone who I know is suffering," um, and then you do it well, and that's um, kind of a sacrifice that you're able to make to God. So. I thought about my, my work and my friendships and anything that I was giving myself to in terms of my faith, or at least I tried to, right? That's a, right. Uh, to completely do that would be a, a project of a lifetime. Right. You said it was my faith that kept me out of the dangers and drama of the college party scene because I made these decisions to work hard, to invest in good mm -hmm. people, to avoid trouble. My time in college was both successful and happy by secular standards. And you go on to say that in thinking about people mm -hmm. in life, I find that my friends who kept the faith in college are generally happier in their lives. Let me ask you, is part of the problem we live in mm -hmm. also today that people want the right to make decisions but aren't willing to live with the consequences and realize that there are consequences? Hmm. I agree, and I also think that another issue is that we're, we're afraid to commit to things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it, I'm reading more and more that young people are hesitating to get married or to, um, to, to really invest in their vocations, and it's because they, they can choose this or that and so many different good things, mm -hmm. but they get kind of paralyzed. If I choose one thing, that means I can't choose another. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've found is that the faith gives us the ability to to really make lifelong commitments. Um, if, you, if you do get married, then you have the grace of the sacrament to help you persevere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I don't think that we can live with the consequences of something like that on our own merit. I think it requires grace, but um, you know, having the faith means that you have access to that grace. Right, and, and you talk about that and how you break up and, and you organize the book. You also say, I thought this was interesting, some mm -hmm. chapters mention things I've done well and others encourage you to avoid my mistakes. And I also realize that my insights, mm -hmm. 10 years in my insights will change. Let me ask you two things. Which are the things that you would say you did the best? Which are the ones you're trying to avoid people making the same mistake? And you've been, you wrote the mm -hmm. book about a year or so ago. Has any of your insights changed in just that little amount of time? Wow, these are great questions. Uh, so I'll take the first one first. Um, so one of the things that I did not do well, but I uh, encourage people to do better um, because I did it better later in life. Um, I guess in the two in the two years since I've graduated, um, is make friends with people who aren't like you. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Harvard, I was I was serious about my faith. I knew I wanted to find other Catholics, get plugged into that community right away. Uh, and I did. So right when I got to campus, I went to the student ministry. I went and found the other Catholics and became friends with them. But looking back at it, um, there were so many incredible people at a place like Harvard that I didn't get access to um, because I didn't open myself up beyond the Catholic community enough. Mm -hmm. So I was very deliberate about doing this uh, in my master's program at Oxford. Um, and that had to do partly with the, the uh, cohort I was in was, uh, I was the only serious Catholic there. Um, but there was something really beautiful in that time about getting to know people with whom I disagreed and people who I could genuinely admire their virtue, mm -hmm. um, even if we didn't see eye to eye all the time. Right. Um, things that I did well, um, I think, I think the, the commitment to, to going to mass every day mm -hmm. um, was really something that anchored my entire college experience. Right. That was something that gave me a community of people. Um, it gave me structure to my day. Uh, and I was really blessed to be able right. to kind of move everything else around, making right. sure that happened. Right. Uh, in terms of how my perspective has changed since then, um, Gosh, you know, I, there's so many different things mm -hmm. I could say about that. I, um, 
Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. You, you kind of structure the yeah. book under community, prayer, academics, and, and living it out uh, as far as the four different uh, mm -hmm. areas you talk about. One of them struck me, the first thing you say, and you say it's in order in your mind of priority and how you have to do things. And so was the community mm -hmm. also, you talk about focus, the idea that it was there, though you decided not to become a member, though you were involved with Opus Dei, you were also involved with a, actually a, a, like a Catholic fraternity, the Daughters of Isabel, I don't know if it's a fraternity <laughs> or a sorority. Sorority, Okay, yep. that, that it started yeah. with, uh, which I wasn't even aware that there was yeah. such, such a thing. But was it also important mm -hmm. there that those people gave you accountability? Oh, absolutely. That's that's a huge part of community. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and um, you know, and just having people to have good, clean fun with. Part mm -hmm. of uh, part of going to college is being able to uh, to be up late and to be meeting lots of new people, and and that's all very exciting and it's very right. good. So, mm -hmm. to have people who you can trust to. Um, to have a good time with, mm -hmm. um, but who you know are going to keep their morals, mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely important. Right. Now, one of the things at the very beginning you talk about different things that are important. One of them is confession, and you say confession is an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. Is that what you found? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think, well, so it's, it's a taste that I acquired early um, because I was raised in the church. Um, my mom was a convert, so she's always had a bit more trouble with it. And people I know who um, are coming from other faiths, especially um, Protestant faiths, they say, well, why do we, why do we need to, to go to the priest instead of directly to God? It can be, and it, it's kind of a psychologically awkward situation because you, you mm -hmm. are talking to God, you are talking to him uh, through his minister, and it can be embarrassing to uh, tell an, uh, an old man or you know, a stranger mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the, the worst things you did in the last month. Mm -hmm. But I found that w once you get used to it, uh, the process is very cleansing. It mm -hmm. actually, there's something in us that wants to, to tell somebody the, mm -hmm. the worst things we did and have them look at us and say, you're still good. Right. You're still a child of God. You're forgiven. Um, and once you see that that happens a few times, I think you start to crave right. that. Now, you talk about also the fact that the toughest semester you had in college, I think it was junior year you were kind of talking about, seemed to be when a lot mm -hmm. of things. What, what made that mm -hmm. so difficult for you? Um, I think everybody has one semester uh, in college, at least, where things are just impossible on a number of levels. Um, it, I, I lost my grandmother, uh, a couple a couple friends um, that I'd known in high school separately uh, died. Oh my. Uh, and I, I hurt my back, and my, I was taking Greek, and I hated it, and so th there, there was just, um, it was a time when I really had to lean into my faith in a, in a whole different way. Mm. Um, and I found that, that my faith was there for me. And I mean, it, it wasn't always fun, and it wasn't always clear what the answer was going to be. But mm. um, I believe I talk about that semester sort of in terms right. of um, finding that your faith really can get you through things like that. Right, and, and in the section on fight the enemy, you say, if the enemy cannot make us proud of ourselves, he'll make us he will cause us to take pride in our humility. If he cannot make us ineffective, <laughs> mm -hmm. he will deprive us of joy and in ministry. The enemy will whisper that moral mm -hmm. compromise is no problem. He is a liar. Is there a lot of pressure, certainly in, in an academic environment like you were, to kind of be syncretistic in the sense that really you may not totally agree, but everything's basically the same and we all need to get along? Mm hmm Yeah, I think there is, although um, I, I sort of wonder if relativism isn't, um, isn't falling a little bit out of fashion. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I, th I think that the, I, I was warned when I was in junior high and high school that the secular world was very relativistic, your truth, my truth. Um, I find that the, the people with whom I, I disagree mm -hmm. um, and whom I had disagreements with at Harvard um, were not saying that everybody's right. Mm -hmm. um, they were saying that they were right and right. that I was wrong and that the values of the church were not simply some good options among many, but w were in fact harmful. I see. Um, 
So I do. I think it's a different set of right. skills that's required to, right. to deal with that. So in a sense, that's actually been a change where it's become more negative, where that's where that is an incorrect way of viewing things and must be challenged as opposed to, okay, if you want to believe that, you believe that, I believe this. I also thought it was interesting, chapter 25, you say know where to look for answers. Yeah. So when you... Uh, that's, that's very important. <laughs> Right. Did you find sometimes people were, and maybe yourself at different times, were, found yourself looking for answers in the wrong places and, and, and had to do a course correction? Hmm. You know, I, I was so lucky that I had such good formation um, before I went to college. And mm -hmm. then once I was in college, I, I just met these incredible people, um, mm -hmm. Peter Kraft and Scott Hahn and and people like that. Um, and because I had met them, things would come up and I'd, I'd email them, okay. you know, and, and ask them, so what, what is your take on this? How do I talk about this? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, part of what I try to do with the book is, um, is say these, these people who write about their faith are, um, they're accessible, they want to help um, and take advantage of them because right. they've dedicated their lives to, to communicating the truths of the faith. Um, so th there's so many good resources out there for young Catholics that are looking for answers. So was there ever a course that you particularly took that you thought maybe your grade had been negatively impacted by your outspokenness or position on mm -hmm. a particular subject? Certainly you talk in the book specifically about the whole thing with the Rhodes Scholarship and, t and deciding mm -hmm. what to say because of the position you believe some of those people might have. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to speak to that. That was an incredible um, story, an incredible blessing. I had been told that the Rhodes Scholarship didn't go to people who were as religious as I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was asked kind of for, for all the marbles at, at the you know, last question of the interview, um, what would you do about embryonic stem cell research, um, which is essentially a question about the sanctity of life since conception, um, I thought, I, I was looking at eight panel members, all former Rhodes Scholars, um, and thinking, you know, they probably think that stem cell research, um, embryonic stem cell research and abortion and mm. all of that are just fine. And if I tell them that this is wrong, then they're probably not going to give me the scholarship. They're going to think I'm a, a religious nut job. Mm. So, I, you know, I hesitated. I said, am I, even in this, like, theoretical situation, am I, um, Am I really unwilling to tell them uh, what they want to hear? And th it, there was, it was just such a moment right. of um, assurance and accompaniment by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I, f I felt like, no, I need to tell them. And it doesn't matter, even if, mm -hmm. even if I lose the scholarship. So um, I, did, I told them the truth. I told them that I thought that life was sacred since conception and that you couldn't um, participate in or cooperate with um, embryonic stem cell research, and they they pulled me aside later, and they said, you know, we knew what you were going to say. We knew that you had uh, a Catholic faith and that this is what you, you should have believed, but we wanted to see if you were willing to actually stand up for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it turns out that, you know, sometimes... Uh, Sometimes you don't have to forfeit right. your soul <laughs> to, right. to gain the world. Yeah. You talk about something called the heroic minute in the book. What's that? Oh, that's fantastic. That's another. Um, that's another Opus Deiism. Mm -hmm. um, and this is again something that like, I'll put in the category of things that I don't always do very well, but I know work. Um, this is where your alarm clock goes off in the morning and you jump out of bed right away. Mm -hmm. So no hitting snooze, no rolling over for another 10 minutes. Um, you jump out of bed, you kiss the floor, you tell God, I will serve you today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the beautiful thing about it is it is a sacrifice and a self-renunciation, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't cost you anything. If, if anything, it's actually kind of good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I encourage it. I think it's a great... Well, uh, just little denial of self. It means that the first thing you do in the day is mm -hmm. a, a victory. Right. Just before we go, uh, how mm -hmm. did you go about writing the book itself, and how long did it take you? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I 
first conceived the plan on Easter Sunday 2015, and then the book was written it's in its entirety by Pentecost, mm -hmm. so 50 days later. Okay. That's a spiritual uh, I was writing my there, master's huh? dissertation at the time, so... <laughs> Yeah, you know, about a chapter a day. Right. Uh, I, I was working on my master's dissertation mm -hmm. during the day, and then I'd, I'd work on the book at night. And it's part of the reason Where why I know this, this project is from God. Right. You know? Where, did, where <laughs> did you write? Where did you feel comfortable most when you were doing your writing? So I was in Oxford, um, and I, I generally would go to, um, to pubs or restaurants mm -hmm. and just kind of tuck into to a corner in a loud place where there was a mm -hmm. lot of... Um, a lot of other activity right. and I could just kind of blend into the right. background and think. Right. Well, maybe you had some influence from yeah. the Inklings. You never know. I sure hope so. Wouldn't that right. be great? That would be great. And uh, thank you so much, Aurora Griffin, for putting this book together, How I Stayed Catholic at Harvard, 40 Tips for Faithful College Students. If you got college students, they may want to take a look at this book published by Ignatius Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. EWTNRC.com is the place. It's a very interesting book. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EW10's Bookmark. Thanks for being with us.